<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Hey everybody and welcome back to another exciting episode of Eggs. Today's special guest is award-winning audio engineer and senior specialist for live sound products at Avid, Robert Scoville. Robert is a modern-day renaissance man with interests and activities spanning the wide breadth of professional audio. He's a 40-year veteran of the professional concert and sound recording industry and has mixed more than 4,000 events in his career. Robert's engineering and production talents have been enlisted by a veritable who's who of marquee acts, including Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Matchbox 20, Jackson Brown, Rush, Def Leppard, and Prince, to name a few, and his body of live sound and recording work has resulted in numerous industry accolades and awards, including six tech awards for technical and creative achievement and sound reinforcement, and two PLSN Parnelli Awards for Live Sound Engineer of the Year. Outside of his work in live music, Robert has consulted on and driven significant advancement in hardware, software, and workflow design for Avid's venue line of live sound products. He is commonly regarded as the pioneer of the virtual sound check and creator of multi-track archiving workflows for live sound, reshaping the live sound landscape forever. Joining us today for a conversation that spans his wild, wonderful years in audio engineering and his experience in driving forward future audio technology, please join us in welcoming to the show, Robert Scoville. Hey Robert, welcome to the show. How are you, man? I am doing good. How are you guys this morning? Very doing well. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are uh, thrilled to make this finally happen between uh, our reschedule, your reschedule, and some <laughs> COVID mishaps and just everything. This is like, you know, the show. I mean, basically. Welcome to the cool. modern world. Yeah, yeah right. it's just where we live these days, right? Exactly. Well, this is the last live show we're going to take before the end of the year. So this is like a big one, right? This is like the, the culmination of a year of episodes and stuff. So uh, we're really excited to pull this one off and make it happen. Nice. Nice. Thank you for the invite. Very cool to be here. So, Robert, uh, let's take a trip back in the way back machine and, and talk about your early, early days. Cause I, I, I love hearing the, how you got into it, what, what kind of got you in, into audio to begin with. And then the first few years of your career. Well, it, it's all pretty well documented, but we'll, we'll recap it here. I'll give you the reader's digest version for sure. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I think I'm a little bit of an outlier in this business. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. But, I, you know, I kind of knew I wanted to get into this side of the business at a pretty young age. You know, by the time I was about, you know, 13, 14, I mean, freshman in high school, I, I kind of knew it's like, mm, that's what I want to do. Uh, so, you know, everything I started doing after that was kind of geared toward getting there. So, uh, you know, high school counselors, et cetera, they were absolutely no help in, you know, 1978. <laughs> I mean, you know, this was still such a cottage industry in 1978, certainly from the live sound side of it, you know, recording was a little more established, but, you know, live sound, I mean, gosh, we were only 10 years removed from Woodstock at that point, you know, so it was yeah. still very, very early. You know, a lot of the gear was, that, that industry was really just coming of age. Uh, but that said, you know, I, I kind of decided, you know, okay, well, this seems technical, you know, I'll, I'll kind of go to college for, you know, to study electronics and blah, 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 and did that. And just happened to get the opportunity to go to work for a sound company locally in Kansas City, uh, you know, a little regional company that was, you know, looking for volunteers to help out on a weekend. They were doing these big shows, these big, you know, 10, 12,000 people for, uh, you know, a weekend, outdoor weekend events. So, you know, I started showing up and helping out with that. And really, once I got there, I was like, yep, this is what I'm going to do. I'm hooked. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I was right. This is what I'm going to do. And, you know, just was able to just kind of, uh, you know, there were some things that fell into place really nicely for me living in Kansas City. I mean, look, I'm in the middle of the country. This is not a media center by any stretch of the imagination. But as fortune would have it, you know, there was a band that came out of there at that time that got signed to a very big deal with Virgin Records. And they they had a lot of success. I, I call them the biggest band that nobody ever heard of. Uh, this band called Shooting Star out of Kansas City. Okay. Uh, so I ended up working with them and... We did tons of touring and, you know, I was with them through, you know, I, I didn't work with them on their records per se, short of just assisting. I was working as a band guy and one of their live sound guys, uh, but was stuck with them through five records and, you know, a whole bunch of shows and was able, was smart enough to parlay that into a career, you know, where you get out. I, we were lucky enough where we were out working as an opening act, you know, for everybody during that period in the early eighties and, 
uh, you know, I was smart enough to to make a lot of contacts and try to make a, a big enough impression on people to get a job and, and carry on my career. So, uh, you know, it was a lot of work. Uh, it took a lot of a lot of dedication, a lot of working for not very much money. And, you know, you got, you know, you just got to be persistent. You know, if you want something, I mean, you just got to go after it and just not take no for an answer. Or, you know, if you do have to take no, just go try again. So yeah. exactly. you know, it's funny hearing some dedication. Of, yeah. Your, your sort of interest in, in music very early, you know, babe, Mike and I have sort of similar experiences and actually I think sort of both worked our way into the music business the same way, which was just kind of hang out long enough that you could find something to do. <laughs> and you <laughs> just show up. <laughs> yeah. It's right. actually funny that you're in Kansas city. My, my first tour day ever was at the Beaumont in Kansas city. Oh my and gosh. So, yeah. Uh, it was kind of funny. I mean, this is in 2001, I guess. And uh, so, but yeah, so, I mean, I, I got that bug early too, but I came in through like street teams and street marketing and doing all that yeah. kind of stuff. And then ended up road managing and doing stuff like that. So I, I wasn't there on the technical side, more on the marketing side. Well, I, I mean, I definitely started out wanting to be a musician, no doubt about it. I mean, I, you know, was playing drums from the time I was about, you know, eight, nine years old, all the way through school and into my twenties, et cetera, you know, playing in bands in Kansas city when I was still working as a sound guy. And one of the best things that happened in Kansas City, and I, this is where I do think it was a little bit of Kansas City was a little bit of an outlier. They had an incredible club scene there in the late 70s and early 80s. And not only did they have a club scene where, you know, lots of bands were playing, but they had a lot of, for some reason, I, I don't know what drove this culture there, but there were a lot of sound guys there and a lot of nice. lighting guys there who were kind of building their own rigs and kind of designing their own speakers and you know, oh, so and so is going to be playing the block. He's going to use this new PA that he built. You know, I mean, it was that kind of thing. You know, and there was this underground culture of that there, and it was really fertile ground. And luckily, the kind of the centerpiece of that was this company called Superior Sound in Kansas City. And you know, they were always holding clinics and always, you know, talking about how to do certain things. And and keep in mind, you know, this, like I said, this was 1979. You know. I mean, you know, what were you teaching back then? You were teaching speaker design. You were teaching what crossovers actually do. And I mean, it, there was nothing digital, nothing. Yeah, I mean, the, it did not it, exist at that point. It was pure FX processors were, weren't even around. Uh, no, you, I mean, you if probably, you were going to use yeah. a reverb, it was probably a spring reverb, a rack mounted yeah. spring reverb in a, yeah. in a box out there, you know? I mean, we just, by the time the early eighties rolled around, we just started to see our first, you know, digital delays that would be used for music production. You know what I mean? So, you know, you really had to, you know, you really had to lean into fundamentals and and understand how things, how and why things worked. So, you know, it, it fueled this culture of it there. And it, I, I'm, I mean, I look back on it now, it would be fantastic to go back and do a little research on the, you know, let's call it the coaching tree, right. Of people that, of production people that came out of that era in Kansas city, it, it would probably blow your mind. It would boggle your mind. You know, it was yeah, really, it was really a cool place to grow up and and get into it. It really was. It, it, for someone like me, who's kind of like come out of, you know, everything's been, you know, since, since I got into it, every, everything's been digital. Nothing's been analog. Um, coming from that, that world, like back to think of like the sound companies having to build their own cabinets and build their own, whatever the mixers or whatever they're trying to do uh, to just get the job done. Yeah. Um, that, that just is amazing to hear those kind of stories. Um, let's, let's talk about, uh, so you, you just got off of the, the tour with uh, that first band who was like the first real second or third real touring artist that you worked with. Um, was it Tom Petty? Was that what I, Oh no, no, I didn't research? run into Tom Petty till years and years later. So this was, you know, if you want to talk about the early eighties, I mean, probably the, my first step into the real, real big time, uh, was probably the go-go's and then okay. kind of leading into John Mellencamp, you know, that, that era right there, around 82, 83, somewhere around there, you know, um, I mean, I had, you know, I had some little kind of one-off scenarios with some big acts, uh, some big country acts in that time, uh, you know, that I would go out and work with for, you know, four or five weeks, et cetera. But, you know, where it was a full-fledged tour, here we go. Uh, you know, you're on the seat and you're going to be mixing, you know, that, it was, it was those two gigs that really kind of, kind of got me going there. So yeah, that was my first glimpse at real touring, you know. So uh, what, what changed in a, in that first real tour uh coming from you know just working at home doing your own thing 
the obviously the equipment upgrade you're working on multiple shows are you on the bus with the band are you uh in your own like tell us tell us just some stories from on the road in no the at, days. at that period i mean you know I, it was bus touring no question about it i mean this was bus touring semis full of gear etc you know i had kind of uh, through again through my work with shooting star and meeting people you know i had kind of hooked up with this company uh called electrotech out of uh canoga park california and you know ended up moving to california to go to work for them at the same time uh, you know it, it was a that company was like a derivative or you know a next gen version of tfa electrosound if you want to look up that name i mean that's one of the stalwart companies that helped start this business so they they had a big pedigree and uh, you know, very powerful company at the time. So it, it was a big deal to get hooked up with them and uh, and get accepted by them and have them, you know, start lobbying acts on my behalf to get to, get the work. So, uh, but, you know, it, it's one of those things is like, be careful what you ask for. You know, you get the gig, you have to perform. You know, it's like, okay, here's the gig. Go to work. Let's see what you got. Uh, but, you know, the, the touring at that time was, uh, you know, it, it, it was cool. I mean, that, that we we were playing big venues. I mean, it was that was a neat thing. It was it was a big step up in responsibility as well as expectation. You know. So on something like that, on a you know a big national tour or something where you're doing several you know maybe arenas in a row or something like that, is that better for you as a sound engineer or worse than sort of like the one off gigs? Like, I mean, it seems to me that you could start to establish some presets and things like that. Uh, although every venue is totally different in terms of the way the sound moves around and stuff like that. Well, I mean, you say here's it's where it's, no. here's where it's an advantage. Uh, and I kind of, I think I picked up on this early on, you know, if you have the same console and PA system every night and, you know, and you are mixing the same band every night, what you start to realize is the impact that rooms are having on your result. You know, yeah. it's like, Hey, don't dismount, don't discount what the room is going to do to this actually taking place here tonight so you know it was a great school for that whereas if you're changing consoles and you're changing pas every night and you know you even if you're mixing the same band it's kind of a moving target it's like well I, you know i don't know why it's sounding like this maybe it's the pa maybe it's the band i maybe it's the console i i don't know because everything's changing every night so you know that kind of actually kind of bleeds into something that i started teaching for a long time once i got into kind of mentorship and and started teaching things is like, you know, what you need to do is start building constants in what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. Find the things that are consistent night to night and then deal with the variables every day and try to make them consistent. Right. So, you know, that, that's the big advantage, I think, to the touring side of it, uh, you know, where you get some consistency in, in, the band that's playing every day. Well, it seems like it would build a a really useful skill set for a sound engineer versus like let's say you you work at a bar or a club or something where you have an established room, an established sound system, all that kind of stuff, and you can just sort of set things up for the room, tweak a little for the band or whatever. But I mean, but the room is the room, and it's always the same gear. It seems like for the guy who maybe comes up through those ranks and just works as a sound engineer in a club like that maybe wouldn't have the chops or the ear or the whatever it is to be able to sort of make the adapting moves or, you know, be able to jump around. as Yeah. Well, well, making that move from clubs to arenas, if you want to talk about that big a jump is a real challenge. I mean, it's a real deal because, you know, you're, I mean, you talk about being thrown from the pond into the ocean. I mean, that's what it's mm -hmm. like. And, you know, if I've seen anything consistently over the years and this continues today, is that, you know, one of the challenges in <laughs> in building a technique, certainly in the early portion of the 80s, is there was nobody to teach you anything. I mean, it was all the school of hard knocks, right? I mean, you, you learn it through making mistakes and blah, blah, blah. But what that also, the danger that comes with that, what that also built was you can build a foundation of really flawed approach in 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 the club scene and in the arena scene for, for that matter too. But it, it's really noticeable in the club scene where you can, where you're, you're, your technique or your approach is just built on what worked yesterday, right? As, as opposed to backing off and looking at it and go, well, is that really a sound approach to what I'm doing here or not? You know, you're just surviving there and, you know, you're only as good as your last show there really kind of thing. Right. And when you make that transition to arenas or big state spaces like stadiums and stuff, you know, uh, man, that can get really revealed. Like if you've got a flawed technique and a flawed approach, it's revealed pretty quickly. So, you know, you're either going to be nimble enough to kind of get yourself back together and, you know, get on board with what actually needs to happen here or, or you're not going to survive it. You know, I, I get, I'll give you another kind of uh, version of this. 
uh, where I've seen guys that have worked in live sound for a long time as mixers and then are thrust into either broadcast or studio mixing and, and fall flat on their face because all of the things they're, they're doing are meant to survive a horrible mixing environment. <laughs> and now you get into the studio where everything's in high resolution and you hear all the things that you're doing poorly, you know? So it's like, you know, I, I kind of, I, I came from the background where I was doing both live and studio work for a long time. And so this kind of came organically to me. And, and I've said this many times in these kind of broadcasts and stuff. It's like, guys, if you want to learn how to mix, if you want to learn how to mix, get in the studio and learn how to mix. Yeah. But that's where you're going to hear things in resolution. If you can make it work out of a small set of speakers and, and work dynamically and where, you know, everything is clear, you can hear it. You can creatively address it the way you want. That's going to work live. That's going to work live. Now there are, there are obviously some boundaries in that. Some of the techniques that are used in the studio, you're not going to get away with in live mixing, but you can do versions of it. And the, the thing that it builds, this is always the missed part of it when people are talking about, or I'm talking to people about doing this is what you're doing in the studio is learning how to listen, right? You're learning how to hear and build, build an expectation so that when you go out in the live field and you push up a fader, you have some idea of what I want it to sound like, right? Exactly. I mean, it, it goes, or goes back to this concept of, hey, mixing is a listening skill. It's not a technical skill. Sure, we're surrounded by technology here, but ultimately mixing is a listening skill. Right? So um, there's, there's a guy that I follow as well. His name's Dave Ratt. And, uh, he's, you probably know him. He, he worked oh, yeah. with the chili peppers. Um, and I, I watch a couple of his tutorial videos as well. And, uh, one of the, th you mentioned like when you go on tour with a big national band, you're using the same mics every day, you're using the same console every day, your EQs on the console are pretty much set. You don't really have to mess with those. When you that's get into a, that's an, a approach an, to take. That's one approach to take for sure. There are people that go yeah, the then completely you, the opposite direction, but yeah, carry on. Um, but but what I was going to say is his his console he doesn't have it set up in front, he likes to have it off to the side, and then he'll watch and then make adjustments so he can just sit there and watch the 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 show, and listen and then turn and make adjustments. And I thought that was a very unique approach. I had never seen that before. Um, and uh, I just when you when you brought up the fact that it's you know mixing is all about listening, and that that's what jumped out to me was the fact that he, he watches the show and he, he listens the whole time and makes yeah. minor adjustments. It, it, so. it To say that's unique is, is accurate. I, I don't know of anybody else that would have ever done that, but where it's validated in my opinion is that he's right. Live sound mixing is a heads up workflow. If you're de looking down like this and making adjustments, you're missing the whole game. The game is up here. You have to be watching and make adjustments and, and try to get audio to fit the visual, right? I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're humans. We're looking and listening at the same time at a show. So your perception of something when you're just listening versus your perception of something when you're watching and listening is very, very different, right? So yeah. on, would I do it that way? I would never do it that way. I need to have my hands on the console <laughs> while I'm watching exactly. and make the adjustment. <laughs> but I get what he's going for there, right? And and honestly, it's a challenge in digital. It really is. It's one of the challenges of digital technology is that it it demands that you look at the technology in order to operate it. Yeah. Right? There's no um, ifs, ands, or buts about it. And uh, it's one of the challenges of that world, you know, where you can, where you kind of get disconnected tactically from the mixing surface. And it's like, that's a danger for live sound, in my opinion, in my opinion. So. Yeah, uh, totally understandable. You've yeah, worked with some, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Did you oh, want I was to just jump say, in? I thought that that was a really interesting observation. I mean, obviously I've been around live music for a long time, but I, I guess I never really put together that part of the, the engineer's job is to sort of connect the experience of what you're seeing to what you're hearing. Without, um, and I mean, it, that and is it, really challenging today. Yeah, well, I'll, and it's I'll just clear tell you. when you when you point it out because, like, you know, if something goes wrong, like that's the first thing you hear, right? I mean, if uh, I don't know a, a speaker drops or you know somebody bumps a fader <laughs> or something, like the first thing you do is go, wait, something's wrong, right? Yeah. And so, and I guess I just never thought of that way. I guess in my mind, it was more like an amplification practice, right? It was, you we're, know, we're doing a I'll, thing on stage and we're going to make it loud. But, I'll tell you where yeah. it really gets revealed yeah. is in stadiums. 
right? If you're mixing football stadiums, et cetera, where, you know, somebody goes to take a guitar solo and, you know, if you were just listening, you think, oh, that's plenty loud enough. That's sitting in front of the mix, et cetera. But then you look up and the guitar player is 60 feet tall on iMag. And all of a sudden it's just like, well, wait a minute. That doesn't, that doesn't match at all. Right. I, I need to make that sound as big as it looks right now. Yeah. Right. To, to make it work for the audience. If you don't, then it's just this kind of video thing going on and there's a little audio thing going on and never the two shall meet, you know? Right. Well, it, I mean, it's, I even it's think challenging in, in watching TV or whatever. I have this really old TV in my bedroom and uh, whenever we're watching anything that's sort of modern, they, I don't know why, but there's some sounds that are super, super loud and some sounds that are super, super quiet always. Well, so, don't even get me into broadcast audio right now. We're going to be <laughs> here for a couple more hours for sure. If you want to go down that road, because well, <laughs> yeah. well, the point I'm trying to make though, is that it pulls you totally out of the experience, right? Yeah. Because what you're seeing on screen isn't matching what you think you should be hearing. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of what we're are trying to articulate here is that our mind is set up to believe that we should be hearing a certain thing from what we're seeing. Yeah. Well, so when we don't, the, the funny part is, see, you know, in, in video, you take cues from the video on what you should hear. Right. I, I give this as a little test, sometimes uh, a little kind of homework assignment uh, when I'm doing teaching, mixing in places is like, okay, I want you, want you to, and this is all under the heading of learning to listen while you're hearing or learning to hear while you're listening, you know, that kind of thing, which was bred into me really, really early by an early mentor of mine. I, I'll, I'll always be thankful of it. But the idea is this, okay. When you're watching a video of mu of a music performance, right. Try to disconnect yourself from what you're seeing, measuring it against what you're hearing. Like when it, like when the video cuts to the piano player, are you actually experiencing the piano now sounding louder in the mix? Mm -hmm. Or if you were just listening and not watching the video cut, what would you think of the mix that's happening right now? It's, it's Solid challenging. Point. And, and uh, I, I mean, I, I cut, I got, I got, I kind of got this blazed into me on a, on one of my first big video projects that I mixed where I mixed audio for a concert video. And this was at a time where, you know, syncing video to audio while you were mixing it, I, I don't want to say it was impossible, but it was just so laborious. It made it not worthwhile because video had to be the master transport. So if you wanted to rewind the tape machines, you had to rewind the video machine and blah, blah, blah. It was horrible when you were mixing. So in the situation, I just disconnected video from audio and I said, I'm just going to mix the audio to the way I should sound, the way I think it should sound. And then we'll resync it with video and have a look at it. And man, was it eye opening. I mean, you yeah. know, I got, I, I was mixing like I was mixing for record, you know, made it and on its own. It sounded fantastic. Buckle it up with the video now. And it's like, when you're watching it, the video, the audio sounds like it's going all over the place because of the cuts in the video. You know, so it was like, that, it was like, wow, okay, let's start over. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that makes it, it really sense. required some like thinking of like, okay, well, if this is the media presentation, there's different mixes that have to happen for this, different kinds of mixes that have to happen for this. Yeah. I, I mean, another yeah, example, like one of my favorite concert videos is this live in Texas by Lincoln Park. And mm -hmm. uh, it, there's something that happens at the end. And, and again, it goes to what my mind wants versus what whoever produced it produced. And, and there's a mismatch between sort of crowd interplay and the singer. So, so yeah. Chester's up on stage and he's saying, you know, and he's saying words and then help holding the mic out so people can sing, but you're not hearing them sing. Yeah. So he's just holding it out and you can hear really quiet, you know, something going on, but it's like, okay, so we're missing the, the yeah. callback, you know, the thing yeah. that you're trying to do. And so there's a couple elements like that that really bum me out in that video. <laughs> so, but so yeah. because that's one of those experiences I want to hang on to, but well, yeah. that's, a, that's a real challenge too. And, you know, I, I've gone round and round with this over the years, cause I, I'm a big proponent of live recordings and, you know, and live mixes. I mean, I mean, I've got, a, I can't see it back there, but I've probably got 500, 600 vinyls of just live music, you know, that's been wow. through the years. I've been studying it for years. And, you know, one thing I've picked up, th this was really popular in the 80s, you know, where people, where bands were doing live records and then going in and overdubbing on them to make them make the performance sound good. Oh, you, let's redo the guitars. They sound terrible. Oh, let's redo the vocal. It's, a, it's got all this voice bleed in it. And, and what ends up being happening, a studio produced album, it becomes a yeah. studio album with some crowd happening in it. And, yeah. and the irony is the more you overdub on it, the lower the crowd has to be because those crowd mics 
have all the previous audio in them, right? So they, they come up and they they don't work together. So, you know, it, that kind of stems all the way back to another conversation of kind of changing how we do multi-track recording for live shows and, you know, trying to get this thing where live is actually live and mm -hmm. not reproduced, you know, so... Uh, so one that, of my, but there, you know, is all about, and, and again, it's a whole nother skill in what we do now is how do we do crowd captures? How do we record crowd and do it well and properly? And, you know, it, it's becoming a, a total science now because it's completely different, uh, for how we record crowds for a stereo recording versus how we're going to do it for an immersive recording. It's a big challenge that we haven't cracked yet. I mean, we've got ways to do it now. But boy, it's challenging if you want to do I, it I right. I can imagine. Yeah. One, of, one of my favorite things to do, um, it, I volunteer every Thursday night for an open mic night, and we have some really good um, musicians here where I'm at. And it's one of my favorite things to do is just hit record on it and try and capture that live sound and capture that live because the flaws are what make it good, in my opinion. The yeah. not, not necessarily the, the horrible flaws, but you know, like you can tell that it's live when you can actually well, you, tell that you it's want live. it to be authentic is the thing. Yeah. Right. hundred percent. And, and it, you can always tell the difference between a studio track and a live track. And I love the live tracks so much yeah. more just because, you they, know, that they whole mindset that is what drove, I mean, what made the bootleg market explode in the eighties, because now really? all of a sudden you had, <laughs> it kind of drove a wedge between the public and producers, right? All of a sudden producers right. were starting to be seen as the enemy because you, you're changing my artist. You know, what we're getting is your vision of the artist, not the artist vision of the artist. So let me go back. I want to hear the original demos from that record, not the not the well-produced record. Or I want to hear the desk mix, the, the desk mix of that live show, not the not the final product. I mean, there's a huge, huge market for that that kind of bubbled up in the 80s and it still persists today. I mean, you know, all of that still exists today. Yeah. Well, and so you parallels too between sort of the the vinyl versus digital kind of conversation too. You know, I've got a friend that's yeah. an audiophile guy, and he's got a really fancy machine. And uh, I went over, and he wanted to basically run my. I you know, I brought a little cheapy turntable and some old records over, and he wanted to put it up against like and whatever music service he was using that you know gives you the AUG files and stuff that are all uncompressed and everything. And you know, he played like I don't know some Beatles track, and it was just you know <laughs> crystal clear perfection, right? I mean, like it couldn't be more perfect. And then we played the same song on the record, and just like the warmth it brings and all that stuff. It's not the same as live, but the point I'm trying to make is the sort of the imperfections are what make it good. You know, it, it's not so much about this, you know, clinical perfection. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's some truth to that. There's some truth to that. Yeah. So um, I, I want to talk about uh, working with artists like Neil Peart and Prince and these perfectionists who are so good at their craft and you have to come in and try and capture that. Like with Neil Peart, I mean, how do you mic his drum kit? <laughs> like, holy cow, there's so many movie parts. Uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm really intrigued at the artist interaction between someone like you and someone like Prince or Neil or, or guys like that. Um, yeah. Do you have any, you know, behind the scenes stories of dealing with that kind of well, level you of know, talent? Either of those guys, you know, I mean, the thing you have to realize as a mixer, for sure, and respect as a mixer, for sure, and try to get the artist to respect, for sure is that you are going to interpret their art and present it to the audience. You're the umbilical cord for that. Doesn't make it to the audience without going through me, right? So exactly. either you have to trust my interpretation or you have to have me be just a pass-through. There is no interpretation that takes place there, right? So it, ultimately what I'm saying is it ends up having to be collaborative. It has to be collaborative. You know, you, you have to have some vision of what that music is needs to be live. Right. And they, they need to, you know, to learn to trust that and respect that. So there's this collaborative process that has to happen. Now, for somebody like Neil, I, I'll say this right out of the gate. Neil is totally a perfectionist, but he knows he's never going to get there. What what why he works so well is he's on the journey to perfection and will take you along with him if you're willing to go. Right. All knowing you'll never get there, but it's the journey that is the reward there. Right. So you know, you, you have to buy into that kind of thing. And and I'm an OCD guy. That, I think that's mm -hmm. why me and Neil played so well together. I'm an OCD guy. I like to take care of details. You know, I don't want to leave a detail unturned in anything like that. So, you know, it, it played into how we addressed his kit. Now that said about Neil, 
maybe unlike maybe any drummer I've ever met before or worked with before, I will say this. He played the most unbelievable mix. You know, I call it a kit mix where you mm -hmm. could just be standing in the room listening to it and go, man, that's the most perfectly balanced drum sound I've ever heard of him just playing it. Yeah. Like, you know, some guys are real cymbal heavy. Some guys are real snare heavy, blah, blah, blah. You just sit and listen. You could put up one microphone in front of that freaking drum kit and it would sound like Neil Peart. Wow. It was, it was incredible from that regard. So anything you did above and beyond that was really all just detail work. Like, I don't want to miss some of these accents in the big space that he's doing. Right. So obviously we, you know, I worked a lot in that period with individual miking everything. Of course we did that. Uh, you know, we were definitely in that mode. Uh, but that said, if I had to go do it again today, I might be a little looser with some of the miking, you know, because the kit is so, was so well put together, so well tuned, so well balanced the way he played it, you know, but you know, it was a, it was a big drum kit. I mean, it was two drum kits. Essentially we had, when I was working with him, uh, when I was working with him, we were still in analog. Uh, and there was one analog console that was dedicated completely to Just the drum for his kit. drums. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's so cool. I mean, it was probably somewhere <laughs> upwards of yeah, But I remember, I mean, it was all microphones and electronics and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was a lot of channels. If you had that plus effects returns, it was probably pushing 50 channels for the drum kit. That's you know? amazing. So um, it, it makes me think, um, just thinking of artists like him and, and like Prince, you know, people who are sort of, I guess, notoriously known as true artists or people who have a vision or, you know, you might call it perfectionist or whatever, but they have a perspective. And I wonder if, is that a consistent thing that you ran into across sort of like all these high performers? Like, does everybody have that? So there's this level of perfection and this level of artistry, or are there plenty of guys that are just kind of like, whatever, just record me and get me out there. Like, well, I'm know, sure there are I'm, guys yeah, out there just that, to... that are vanilla with it. We'll call it that, you know, but I think every artist has a vision of what they want their thing to be, you know, they they want it to sound like, uh, or they want it to be presented. Like, uh, the problem is, you know, at least the problem for many, many years, certainly pre, you know, let's call it 2005 was that the artist was on stage, right? So they had mm -hmm. no sense of what was actually being presented to their audience. They couldn't. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to bring no that way up they the difference between, uh, front of house and monitor world. Uh, oh, it's you're chalk and cheese. I mean, there's, yeah, there's it's no completely comparison. different things. So what they hear as a monitor engineer is, is completely different versus what is coming out of front of house. And so yeah. uh, for our listeners, that's, that's, well, I mean, so day. they, here's, here's the funny part of it. So they kind of rely on people, maybe not even me, the mixer, but they rely on other people to come back and tell them how it is. Yeah. Maybe it's a, a wife, maybe it's another musician, maybe it's whatever who's out listening and go, you know, they'll talk to him in the dressing room and go, how was it? Well, you know, blah, 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 blah. So they try to connect the dots that way. That, and the that sad part, the sad part about that years. is, is the wife could be sitting in a bad area or could be sitting in a, uh, <laughs> I have this one, like this one group that uh, I, that the the wolverines and pocatello and and they're they're pretty good it's we got it's a it's a bluegrass band but the wife always sits right next to the speaker and it's always hard for me to deal with because i'm yeah. sitting further back i get the full mix and it, it's it's always interesting to to deal with that kind of thing so well, um the thing that yeah. changed that <laughs> is virtual sound check right yeah so yeah. Uh, you know, I, and I'll tell you this little story because I, I love telling this story because it, it was just such a cool kind of watershed moment for that whole concept. So, you know, I started developing virtual sound check in the early, let's call it mid nineties, around 1994. I was doing it, doing it in analog for a period of years, just kind of trying to work it out and see if it was valid and, you know, see if it was going to be a real thing. And long story short, you know, I was doing it on Tom Petty. I was doing it on rush through the nineties and none of the artists knew about it. Right. I would always oh, really? do it pre an actual sound check. Cause I, I didn't know how they were going to respond to it. I was like, Ooh, I don't know. So I kind of kept it hidden from them. I didn't show it to them in any way, shape or form. I would come in and do it before the actual sound checks and before the line checks uh, to kind of do PA tuning and all kinds of things using ADATs and pro tools uh -huh. and other things by the late nineties. Yeah. But once I went to work for Avid you know, it kind of became this kind of thing where it's like, well, we need to get this actually into a product and make it an actual process and an actual workflow. So, you know, I kind of worked over my first few years at Avid, you know, trying to get that pushed into place. And we did that in 2005, 2006, right around there with the release of the first venue console, which had virtual sound check capabilities, actual virtual sound check capabilities. 
So the first time I ever took it out and used it under fire was on Tom Petty. So we were in rehearsals in 2005 in, at Sony, I think at the Sony stages in Los Angeles, full PA system, full lighting, everything, you know, and we had gone through a couple of days of rehearsals and I thought, you know what, I'm going to come in and, and run virtual sound check through its paces here and come in early one day, uh, you know, 10 in the morning, whatever, and just break everything down into its smallest components and listen and, and rebuild and just see what was really going on here, you know, really kind of tunnel in on it. So I'm in there. I'm the only one in the room. At least I think I'm the only one in the room. And I am, I mean, just tearing things apart and, you know, listening to vocals raw, listening to guitars raw, <laughs> er, everything, you know, <laughs> only to realize that in the back of the room, Tom has come in early, right? He's oh, sitting wow. on a couch in the back of the room. And I didn't realize it. he had come in for an interview and the interview was late or whatever. So he was just sit sitting, listening to me work. So this went on for a good, you know, maybe an hour and a half, a couple of hours. And he comes strolling up to the console and I was like, oh, hey, when did you get here? And he goes, I got here about 10. And of, oh, of course, you man. had this moment uh, in your mind of, oh, my God, what did this guy just hear me do <laughs> to his music? You know, yeah. but, you know, the the cool thing about it is he totally got it. Like he got it from the get go. He was like, oh, because it's a studio workflow. You know, I mean, it's yeah. just like him sitting in the control room, listening to tracks and, and building mixes. So he totally got it. And the best thing about it was, you know, and he said it, he was like, you know, I've never, ever been able to hear how my music's being presented to my fans, you know, and That's I'm hearing amazing. it here now. And we kind of worked on a few things together. And all of a sudden, you know, he was just from that moment forward, he was a different guy on stage. Like his really? confidence what, what, in the show, changed? his confidence in the show changed. Okay. Like, you know, if he was hearing something that felt odd in monitors, you know, he was, he, he would, I don't want to say he would let it go, but it didn't flip him out thinking, oh my God, it's oh, horrible okay. out front. He knew what it was yeah. out front. Matter of fact, we had a, a little revisit of it one day when things in monitor land were not going great. I don't, I don't remember what venue it was, but he was having some trouble up on stage and he, he decided he was just going to come out and listen to hear it. And, you know, this was when we had switched over to line source. So, you know, the, the rejection in the back of the PA was pretty amazing. Yeah. So he comes walking off stage and the band is playing and he comes out and he made it about 30 feet out in front of the PA. And then I started to turn around and just walk back to the stage <laughs> and he got back over and he goes, no, 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 everything's good out we're, there. We're good. <laughs> we got to work up here for a few minutes. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. <laughs> but you know, the, uh -huh. the, the long and the short of it is, you know, like I say, he got, he really saw the big picture that day at Sony. And from that tour forward, I think on the first week of that tour, we did four or five actual sound checks where he would come in with the band and they would sound check. And then from that point in 2005 till the end of his career in 2017, we never did another actual sound check. That's amazing. Oh, wow. I mean, he trusted um, it, that process implicitly, you know? So, you know, I, of course we would come in, like if we had to go do a broadcast or whatever and do camera blocking, they would come in for that. But on tour, we never did another sound check. We didn't did another actual sound check. That's amazing. Can you, can you talk about uh, working with Avid and, and how you got involved with them? And then, uh, the I mean, like the fact that you helped develop the virtual sound check process, that to me is just awe-inspiring. So yeah. well, <laughs> if and you if can I tell can, us a little I'd bit like about to, that. Yeah, if I can, I'd like to just kind of add to that too, which is, just uh, obviously you've seen all the analog, you've seen all the digital and you and, and Avid and other companies like them, like you guys are the innovators that made that transition. Yeah. So I wondered, not only would you talk about your experience at Avid, but would you talk about some of just the, the biggest hurdles to overcome in making that analog to digital? Yeah. Okay. So let's take it in two steps there. Let's uh, I'll talk about the, the entry at Avid first. So that is something that came completely out of the blue to me. Uh, and I mean, the story of it is actually kind of cool. So in the 1980s, in the mid eighties, I was uh, touring with an artist named Laurie Anderson. Uh, it's kind of, you know, avant-garde kind of uh, performance art kind of thing. It was absolutely an awesome tour to be on. We, we toured the world. The keyboard player on that tour was a guy named Dave LaBolt, right? He was the head keyboard player and, you know, kind of working with Laurie to get all of these, incredible <laughs> keyboard things going on on that tour. It was just mind blowing, but he and I really hit it off. We hit it off really, very well. We became pretty close friends on the tour. 
you know, as touring friends, kind of we'll, we'll put those kind of quotations about it. But we would hang out on days off, you know, blah, 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 and, and talk about a lot of things. And we were always talking about, oh, man, if we could only do this. And yeah, if we could only do this. Well, tour ends. Uh, I go off on other things. He goes off on other things, other keyboard assignments, et cetera. And then over a period of years, I start, I had heard through the grapevine that David had gone to work for DigiDesign, mm-hmm. right? And lo and behold, he got into a position there where he was driving the development of Pro Tools when it was coming out of the new bus era and, and you know, really turning into an actual powerhouse of a studio product, you know, where the DAW was really starting to make its impact. So he's he did that whole stretch of the 90s where, you know, Pro Tools developed really, really intensely. So now we're 15 years away from us, you know, hanging out together and being together. And I get a call completely out of the blue one day. I, this was probably in 1999, 2000, maybe somewhere around there. And he goes, hey, Rob, it's Dave. I was like, hey, what's going on, man? Long time, no love, you know, blah, blah, blah. He goes, hey, we're thinking about doing a live sound product. Uh, I, I want you to come up to Daily City and meet with me. Let's let's sit down and discuss it and see what you think we can do and, you know, whether we can pull this off, you know. So, you know, I, I had a lot of apprehension about digital at the time. I certainly had a lot of apprehension about digital design doing anything, anything digital for live sound at the time. But after some meetings and, you know, some cool napkin drawings, which I always say, I wish I still had those napkin drawings, man. Right. They were so cool. <laughs> uh, you know, within, you know, about a five-year design cycle there, you know, I, I kind of worked as a, you know, kind of a super consultant on the thing where I wasn't working for the company, but they were bringing me in to validate ideas and, and concepts and stuff and, you know, develop those sorts of things. Um, you know, lo and behold, venue comes out into the market, you know, and, Mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of apprehension about it, but that turned out to be a really, really cool thing. You know, I, I think if that console was the first one to the market, it would have failed horribly. Uh, but luckily Yamaha kind of seeded the market for us and, and made digital viable for live sound. And then we, we kind of came in and put our own spin on it. Uh, and had had really, really incredible success with that, more than I ever dreamed we would ever have with those products. So at some point in 2005, 2006, they just said, hey, do you want to just come to work for us? I mean, can we just hire you and have you constantly you know, be a, a full-time member of this team and, and develop this thing going forward? And at that time, I was looking to kind of pull back a little bit from touring. I mean, I, I had had kids and you know, I think I was up to about two kids, maybe three by then and, and wanted to stay home and be dad a little bit. So, you know, as it turned out, I didn't really pull back from touring in very much. I had actually ended up touring and working for Avid through all those years <laughs> and, and still continue to do so today. Uh, but that's been a really, really rewarding part of my life, um, getting to be involved in console design. I, I mean, I've learned more about it than I ever would have learned just being a user in the field. Uh, I'm way more probably pro digital than people are comfortable with. Sometimes, you know, it's like, uh, you know, the, the conversion from analog to digital is two things, right? It's one is workflow. You know, you have to learn a completely different mindset in terms of console operation. I mean, certainly there's some similarities at one level between analog and digital, but it's also learning how to deal with signal quality differently than in analog and you know, I, I'm not one of these people that say we, we should go back to everything analog. We shouldn't. Uh, I, I'm completely pro digital, but I'm not anti analog either. We need them both. We need them both. Mm-hmm. We don't, you know, it's not a binary argument. We're not going to go back to having one or the other. They're both going to be here and they both have their rightful place in this world. Uh, so, you know, uh, digital haters, I'm sorry. It's going to be here for a while. <laughs> Uh, and, but the cool, and I've, I've said this from very early on, I, I, I think I learned this very early on in digital, you can have the best of both worlds. You can get something that has analog sound quality to it and still have all the digital flexibility and capability at your fingertips as well. Now, if you want to be a purist and go analog, by all means, go ahead. I, I I'm not going to stop you, but you know, you're in, in terms of other pieces of it, I don't want to even say you're sacrificing it, but you're, you're leaving a lot of possibility off the table by going to analog and just saying, I've just got to have the clearest signal path and that's it. You know, I've got to have, I got, not only have I got to have the cleanest signal path, I've got to have the dirtiest signal path because it's got to sound analog, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say it's, it's kind of one of those things and, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that, you know, as technology advances, it's always been about 
you know, higher, higher fidelity, you know, cleaner, whatever, higher resolution, whatever. But in audio engineering specifically, I mean, part of it is to try and make it sound old. Like it is to try and replicate old sounds and, and that it's sort of the, thing, you know, and you see it even in like design or art or whatever, you know, we've, we've got all these, we see it in film as well, film add, and photo at age, mm-hmm. you know, so it's kind of funny how the, the technological advancement is actually to improve upon the old way of doing things. Well, it, it's part of the programming that's taken place, taking place in Western civilization specifically for the last 50 or 60 years. Right. What, what think about what we equate film compared to video with. Film is a credible art. Video is a low cost solution to getting product out. Right? Yeah. Put film look on video. Now all of a sudden it looks more credible. Yeah. It's a, it's a very similar thing in the audio world as well. And the irony of all ironies, I've talked at, you know, ad nauseum about this. This is the irony of audio in my opinion, is that for years, and years. I lived through these decades. Audio engineers wanted this. I need a signal that has no distortion. I need a signal that has no harmonic coloration in it. I need to be able to transport it without any degradation. Blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. That's digital. Yeah. That's what digital provided. It's exactly what digital provided to the audio community. So, and it's not some conspiracy by the manufacturers to change the world they provided exactly what the audio community was asking for only to find out when it got there. It's like, well, hang on a minute. That doesn't sound right. It actually does sound right. It sounds exactly like the source. It just doesn't sound like what we've been listening to for the last 50 or 60 years. It doesn't sound Mm -hmm. like the music we love of the sixties and seventies because that music has all of those artifacts in it, let alone the music itself. That's a whole different discussion. But if you want to talk just pure sound quality, nothing rivals digital in terms of sound quality. It's in terms exact, of a right. representation of yeah. the original, analog doesn't even come close to that. Right. Well, and it, it's like you said, everyone's trying to get the feel or the sound of what the analog was doing to it. And now right. that the plugins are getting to the point where they're almost as good and you can't really tell the difference almost. Uh, well, they're good for, enough. I, I, you know, yeah. that's what I say. And especially for live sound, you have to look through that. Uh, if we're talking live sound here, not studio now, let's stay in the live sound world. You know, there's a practicality that comes with it in live sound, right? If, if I want to make something sound more analog or if I, if, if, heaven forbid, we want to add tape saturation to something, right. that's something we've never had in live sound because yeah. we can't, we don't have tape machines out there. Right. Yep. I mean, that was the epiphany I had in the, when I made the full transition from studio to live sound, you know, that was the one that I couldn't quite map out. It was like, okay, I I know what this works in the studio. Why am I not getting that result here? You know? And then it, it, I honestly, it didn't dawn on, on me for years and years and years. It's like the tape compression is what's missing right now. Mm -hmm. The tape compression. And I remember the first time I put on some tape compression plugins on a digital console, I remember thinking, oh there my gosh, <laughs> there it is. Yeah. There it is. Uh, well, you know, it's that the, combination the... of even an harmonic in a compressed format, a compression format where you go, of course, of course, that's what analog tape is doing. That's why we align tape machines the way we did was to get that to happen. Right. Yeah. Mm. Well, and it, it, you also got to think of ease of use too. If you're backlining in a stage, you hit a button and sound check's done. It's the same thing. Well, it's a little more than in that, between right? tracks, even. Yeah, you know what I mean. But you know, like you can do a sound check in advance, save the presets, and and go and work on another band and come back, and it's yes. right there, ready to go. Yes. yes. Um, that just that by itself is. Uh, a major selling point for digital well, boards. The learning curve for digital, th- this is part of what makes the learning curve for digital so stiff sometimes and so steep is that, you know, if we want to get credible analog results in digital, we have to put them in there. Like we have to add them. So what it re- actually requires is that you kind of go back in time and learn why things sounded the way they did. Right. It's not just one thing. It's not just distorting the signal at this point in the chain. It's a whole series of things that need to take place there to make it credible analog sounding. Right. You know, you brought up the Dave Rat thing, which I thought is, you know, I watched one of his recently that was really interesting on Transformers. Right. Uh-huh. I watched that one. You know, well, you know, it, Transformers, you know, changed the, the sound. 
Yeah, they do. And it's, yep. it, you know, it's not, not a matter of choosing which one is right. It's choosing which one is preferable. Which one do yeah. I want it to sound like? Right. And transformers are one small piece of that analog sound. That's why people want to go through transformers to get specific sounds. You know, I want preamps that use Lindahl transformers, right? Because they sound a specific way. It's not about making it sound natural. It's about making it sound preferable, right? Exactly. Nothing yeah. we do, nothing we do in pop music and rock music sounds natural. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. So we're starting to get towards the end of the hour here. I wanted to ask you one thing. It's sort of come up throughout or been sprinkled sort of throughout our conversation, but it's this idea about mentorship. And mm. I think there's this idea that, you know, here you are this expert, you know, that you're this lone wolf and you've, you've done all this and you've accomplished all these things. Right. And I don't think there's enough time paid to it. And you mentioned like in your own teaching and stuff like that, you know, it, the importance of sort of mentorship to you. So I wondered if you wouldn't go back and talk a little bit about just sort of the people who helped you along the way and sort of the value yeah. of mentorship for you in the past and maybe you now paying that forward to students or whomever you're working with. Yeah, I, it, it, pay it forward is the right term to use uh, associated with it. I, I certainly feel, I, I, I guess obligation is the right word. I certainly feel obligation to do that. I mean, I, I look, it seems like every year I look back on it and I get more and more respectful of what those people did for me when I was young. You know, I just look back on it and just think, man, where would I be if I hadn't met that guy? You know, if I hadn't met that guy, what, where would I be right now? Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Cause you know, they either take you under their wing and teach you something really critical or really important that kind of changes the direction of what you do and where you go and the results you get, you know, it's just these little bitty steps of it throughout your career that, that get you long, you know, farther and farther along. Like, I, I mean, I've had met, I've had mentors at Avid that have taught me things about, you know, digital technology, about audio, about business, about branding, about all of it that I, you know, I'm sitting here talking to you today. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today without that, yeah. you know? So, I mean, I, I try to go back and thank these people personally, you know, uh, certainly some of the people in the very earliest days of me getting a job, you know, my first job in audio, I've, I, you know, I've tried to pay them great homage and, and go back and always try to give them recognition, et cetera. But, you know, th there's a respect that comes with it as well. Um, where you have to respect, how do I want to put this? You have to respect what you say to people as a mentor. Like you had to be, as a mentor, you had to be very, very aware of what you're saying and what you're teaching to people, because people, you know, I, I, over time, I've, I've certainly learned it's like people are hanging on your every word here. Mm -hmm. So make sure what you're saying is as right as you know, it can be, you know, don't. Yeah. I, and unfortunately we see a lot of this in the business today with the internet, you know, and YouTube and all of this, man, there are a lot of charlatans out there, a lot of charlatans. And I just got to, I know I'm going to sound like you're going to probably respond and go, okay, boomer, but <laughs> man, there is a lot of bad information out there right now. I mean, really bad information, really errant, wrong information. I just, I follow some of these live sound chats and rooms on Facebook and YouTube and stuff. And I just think, oh my gosh, what are you telling these people, man? And it's people that are, you know, the, the, the worst part about it, the worst element of it, it's that, and if you've been around for a long time, you can spot it a mile away. It's people who are still very new to the business speaking with absolute authority. Yeah. And it's, right. you know, that's kind of the, the crime of the internet is there's no accountability for it. You know, they don't have to be accountable for what they're saying. It's just on some internet. Yeah, chat room, speaking you know? with authority is often enough. You know, it's funny. I always, oh. joke, you know, that, cause there were times when we were on tour that I'd forget my badges or whatever, and I couldn't get backstage. And so my thought was always just walk with purpose, right? Be a, <laughs> have authority. Just, you know, just kind of and how, right how often did it work? Yeah. Almost every time, every you know, time. Right, these were smaller venues. I wasn't trying to get back to, you know, Steve Perry or something, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was trying to get back to my roadie but um you know so it wasn't that big a deal but but I, I think that idea sort of permeates which is this you know if you can come off authentic or come off uh, authoritative i guess is a better word it doesn't really matter what you're saying and people yeah. will sort of buy it and they'll buy your program or they'll get into whatever it is you're doing and, and it's just rampant well not only will they buy it and here's the harm it programs in 
Mm-hmm. Like, I think the thing that that made me start to respect this more, and you know, it's it was part of the uh, uh, thing that drove me in teaching. It's why I, you know, I got as much out of the teaching as probably the students did, is I had this thing of if I'm going to teach it, I, I got to know it forwards and backwards, and 100%. I got to get it kind of peer reviewed. Okay, this is what I plan on saying. Is this right? Is this accurate? You know, that whole kind of thing, because I've experienced it where someone has taught me something very early in my career. And here I am 40 years later now. And when something like that comes up, I still have to kind of go, nope, it's not what they told you. This is what actually happens there. I yeah, still do it lo- to this day, 40 yeah. years later. It's one of the things that we've uncovered in doing this podcast and interviewing so many people of different ilk is that there's a little bit of life that is just layering stuff on, right? Like you have to, you have to have done the time. And so you yep. get these people that come out and, you know, like you, like you mentioned, they're kind of new to the industry. Maybe they've just been working in their local market or something. And now they're the expert. Right. And, uh, I, I think that there's just something to this time served, you know, I equate your experience as, as you've described it from going from analog to digital and from the way you did it in the seventies to the way you do it now, like, you know, my journey was sort of like that with technology, right? Like in, there was a time when, if I wanted to be online, I had to learn how to program, right? If I yeah. wanted to have an internet connection, I had to learn how to get connected. You know, I had to do all these things and maybe it's just age, but we have the benefit of having worked through that, right? At the time you might not have seen it as a benefit, but it seems like for people like you, you've got such a thick layer cake of experience. Yeah. You're able to put together decisions or like you said, spot, spot the fake, <laughs> you know, without even having to think about it because you've been there, done that and innovated the technology. Right. And yeah. so for me, it's the same. And, and I think for most people it is, but for it, like you mentioned about accountability, these folks can just go online and basically can shout into a vacuum and they're not getting yeah, the yeah. criticism from people like you saying, wait a minute, buddy, <laughs> like, do you even know what you're Well, actually about? they are. If you see some of my responses, <laughs> <The> comments, <laughs> I'm, right? <laughs> I'm not too kind with it sometimes. You specifically. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, uh, I think it's what is it the term talent stacking uh, you develop like uh, you figure out one thing and then you figure out something that associates with that one thing and then you figure out something else that ties to that uh, and all of a sudden it all starts to make sense and you actually develop an ear for what you're doing and you you can hear this stuff and do this and and you're like oh I did this one time and it fixed this and just all the different things that you've done over the course of your career add up to this collaborate it, this total... there's also a process that i do though and I, I try to encourage people to always be open to do this is i'm always always looking for ways to validate what i'm doing yeah like you know if if something's working today it's like okay well that worked great but is it is that going to become part of my approach like is that going to work for everything or is it you know how do, how do i how do i actually back off and validate what i just did there and say yeah okay that's actually working there you know, because right. people take everything at, at kind of face value. And in, to some degree, I have reverence for people that are just coming into the business now. I mean, I think about the amount of information and choices and things that are laid at their feet that they need to kind of dig through and learn compared to what I went through, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, what was I, I mean, how many mixers did we have you to choose had so from many in options. 1979? Had two. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they were they were credible, you know. I mean, it was Midas and Yamaha. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm over exaggerating <laughs> that. But but yeah. still, the amount of I, I mean, I, I I look at things like you know silly things like okay, in 1979, what microphones did we have at our disposal in live sound? Yeah, 58. <laughs> I, it was it was, was that even around? Lot. Yeah, yeah, it was around. Yeah. It was around, but okay. it was new. It was kind of new to the market. Yeah. Compared to the amount, the sheer amount of microphones that that, that to me to kind of that go gets through me and all the- go, okay, well, which one is the is this going to solve my problem? You know, I'm just like whoo. That's something I, I I'm I'm fairly new. I, I've only been doing audio for live music for five six years now, and I every day I learn something else. Or I'll try a different technique, or I'll use a different mic on this and that, and. Uh, it, like you said, it's overwhelming to to just okay. Let's let's just give it a try. See what it does, and then <laughs> go from there. You know, it's it's kind of fun actually. But uh, well, Petty gave I, me the great love it. the great you know mindset to have for that. And, and, you know, because we were talk we were going through changes and trying different amplifiers and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. You know, guitar amps and stuff. And he was and he, it apparently he's like this in the studio all the time as well. Which was, hey man, good is good. If it's good, yeah. move on. You know, don't, oh, don't sit here and dwell on it, you know, and, and try to change it. If it, if it's doing what you needed to do, 
then move on. You know, let's make some music at the end of the day. Let's not get caught up in microphone choices. Yep. Said the guy uh, who's sitting here talking into a 40 year old microphone. And I podcast. was going to ask you, what is that microphone? <laughs> That's a, I, I see the, the, like the case around it. And I, yeah, it's a, I don't uh, recognize it. I mean, I pulled it out of my stash of freaking hundreds of microphones back here. I'm sure you, you know, have it over the course collection. of uh, doing different podcasts. Oh, let's try this one today, you know, so, uh, but it's a buyer. I don't even know the model. Okay. Maybe a 308. I think, I think it's 308. I mean, nice. it's an old ribbon microphone from them. Uh, and it, of all the ribbons I tried, I thought this was the best sounding one of my voice. So yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It's, it's been fun to pull that out and, and get it going. Yeah. Well, cool, Robert. So I think we're kind of at that time. Is there anything you want to give out as far as ways our listeners might be able to get in touch with you, where they can learn more about the work you're doing, maybe uh, seek out your mentorship or, or purchase a product from you at Avid? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, if you want to follow me, uh, there's probably, I, I just got rid of Twitter. So I won't go on the political <laughs> rant, but I just dumped there Twitter. Yep. I'm not on yep. that anymore, but uh, you can reach me on Instagram for sure. You can follow me there. Uh, Robert Scoville. Uh, if you want to follow me on Facebook, it's again, it's Robert Scoville with one L, unfortunately, on Facebook. Uh, if you want to look at it, I, I've got a ton of video posted up on YouTube, uh, tutorials on how to do certain things. Most of it's console specific, but there's also a bunch of blogs up there. Like I've done touring blogs where I've blogged every day of the tour and you can go up and look nice. back on days of the tour. Uh, so again, uh, just l search my name, Robert Scoville on YouTube. Uh, I run a Friday social meeting called the back lounge. Nice. Uh, if you go to robertscoville.com, you can sign up for that. And it's just free entry. You just come in and hang out and talk with us. Just like the back lounge of a bus, just come on in and shoot the breeze. So that's available. That's usually on Fridays at, uh, we started at four 20 Pacific time. Uh, so just, uh, sign up, get on the email list and the link shows up every week for you to do that. Love it. Uh, what else? I, got? I found, I found you on LinkedIn and yeah, uh, I was going to say I'm on LinkedIn as across. well. Yep. And, uh, finally I've just started posting up as, as kind of what brought you there. I think, uh, all of these walk-in music playlists from tours that I've done in the past, I'm in the process of compiling them all, but there's probably 25 different playlists uh, created by different artists on my Spotify profile. So if you want to search me out on Spotify, you can follow those and share those playlists. Those are really fun, really fun to listen to. Yeah, I've really It's a nice those. break from Mar Mariah Carey for the holidays. If you want. <laughs> right. You break off of All I Want for Christmas and, you know, get some muddy waters in your life. You know, that's, like there it. you go. So cool. Well, thank you so much, Robert. We really appreciate you taking the time for this. It's been awesome uh, just hearing about your backstory and sort of the, the way technology moves. It's a, it, an awesome industry and Mike and I both love it. So I appreciate you taking the time. We're going forward, guys, not back. We're not going to go back. So let's keep going it. forward. I love it. Well, thanks so much, everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.